Love you, man. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, take those words to heart. And there's lots of stories of God working among us. And uh, it's good for us to share those stories from time to time time again to encourage one another so thank you all right well this morning is what I'm calling a, um, a bumper message because it's really um, and it's a bridge message we are between series so we did Proverbs and hopefully you remember that one and then we're moving to a new series that I'm calling life together that is our fall series and you're gonna hear a lot more about that in the next coming months in that series by the way we're going to be primarily focusing in on one chapter of Scripture. It's going to be Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to take our time working through it. So we're looking at what the church is and what God has put together and what our part is in it. So that is going to be our new series coming into the fall. And today's message actually bridges both series about a life of wisdom and the choices that we have to make and what God is doing through the church and in the church. So the title of this message is right there, and there's a tire, and there's tires up here, and we'll get to that in just a little bit. Rob made a joke today. He said, you're going to get a lot of mileage out of this message. And I was like, oh, there's more of those jokes coming, believe me. Okay. <laughs> so it's called <laughs> traction, okay, growing forward. And this entire message is summed up in one verse, and it is easily um, memorized, and it's fairly simple. And I want you to pay attention to the words we are going to focus in on, because it has been a, um, a parenting, our parenting philosophy as we raised our kids. And when I was a youth pastor for uh, 13 or so years, it was my youth ministry philosophy. And so we are going to focus in on these words, and they describe Christ's life while he was growing. And from those things, we are going to see some areas in which we need to focus on, in particular for, for people who are from zero to 30, and those who are parenting kids in that range, or grandparenting kids in that range, and who are continuing to roll forward in their life to pay attention to each one of these four areas. Now, when we think about the story of Christ, and if we would continue to read the Gospel of John, which I referenced this morning, in particular the Gospel of Luke, we hear a lot about Christ as an infant. We know the story story of the angels. We know the story of God's Spirit talking through an angel to Mary and Joseph, and we know the appearance of Christ. We know a lot about that beginning of his life. And then the next thing we read about Christ, we fast forward through his infancy, and we have another window of understanding the development of Christ when he was with his parents, remember this, going down to the temple when he was around 12 years old. Their parents went there every year to the festival. Jesus came along, and during his 12 visits, per se, he was interacting with the scribes, and, and his parents forgot him there. They were leaving. They went back to look for him, and he said, Mom, Dad, you would know that I'm in my father's house. And then he went to be with his parents. Now, the next scene we see of Jesus is when he's around 30. And we have a lot of information about his ministry, about his teaching, about what he did, how he died, and of course, rose again. Now, between these gaps, <laughs> there is one verse that describes Jesus's growing up years, especially between 12 and 30. And that's the verse that we're going to focus on today. Now, this verse has significance because it covers a large span of Jesus's life, all the way to his teenage years, all the way to his 20s. And so 
we need to focus in on this verse. And I want to encourage you to memorize it. And the reveal has already happened. And that should be Luke 2, 52. That says Luke 3, 2. Who made those slides? I did, okay? That should be Luke 2, 52, okay? And so if you have your Bible, just look at it or you can look here. And this is the NIV and different versions have it just a little bit different, but the same. And this is how it goes. And Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. That's it. Covering a decade, covering decades of his life. So we're going to focus in on these words. And I want you to think about these areas in your life. And I also want, to think, want you to think of these if you work with youth, if you mentor someone under 30, if you have little ones in your home or grandchildren who are among you. I want you to think about these areas and then incorporate with understanding how to see these areas areas develop so that those of us who are going forward will do so to make an impact and go the difference, make a difference and go the distance with their life. So the first thing I want you to focus in on, in particular for young people, is number one, focus on growth. Circle that and underline these verses. Jesus grew. That's why we are growing forward. So the times between 0 and 30 in particular are times of growth. How does that help us? Well, it helps us in knowing that if you are in that category, you do not know everything, even if you think you are. Thank you, 16-year-old, right? You don't know what you think you know. These are years that we are to grow and to develop and to mature. Growth requires grace. Growth allows for failure. Anyone in here ever regret anything you did when you were under 30? Heard it said that the most regrettable years of at least Americans' lives are the 20s. I think there's some truth to that. Growth allows for failure, which also should give us freedom from fear because you do not have to be perfect. Some of us and even our children may have fear to try something new because they're afraid that they will fail. I think that thought has risen more so to the surface because of the internet. Anyone here ever go on Instagram? Instagram. Photos of the perfect life. Videos of all things together. And so viewing the windows of, through the windows of people's lives at their best airbrushed moments. Thousands and thousands and thousands of images scare in particular young people that they'll never be good enough, they'll never do enough. 
and it tells them that they're a failure. The good news is that when we are young in particular, we will fail. It's okay to fall down, but it's not okay to stay down. Encourage your kids to try new things. Expect progress, not perfection. Encourage them to try new things. Think new thoughts to explore. We as parents, we as grandparents, this requires patience. Doctors are not the only people who require patience. That was another joke. Okay. And God's like, oh, Lord, deliver us from his jokes. Okay. Have you ever lost it with your kids or your grandkids? Okay. God, help us to understand they're growing. God, help us to understand process. Be patient with your kids. Be patient with your grandkids. Encourage them to continue to grow. So during those years of our development, your children's development, even in the life of Christ, not that he failed when it comes to sin, but he learned we know that his father was a carpenter, and they tell him that he was, or say about him, here is the carpenter's son. Jesus had to learn to shape buildings if he worked with stone. Had to learn how to sand wood if they worked with wood, which I'm sure he did. He learned, and our children and our grandchildren are learning be patient be encouraging and help them to grow so if you're in that category focus on growth focus on expanding focus and give yourself grace that you do not have it all figured out and those of us over 30 we don't have it all figured out either Jesus grew. Understand that you're growing. Understand that they are growing. And give lots of grace. So, Jesus grew. And then we get four areas in which Jesus grew. And I use an illustration of a car, and I've, I've, I have drawn it out for my kids. I've drawn it out for lots of parents at times, helping me recognize that we need four tires in order to roll forward. And you say, amen, right? They don't make three tired cars. Well, I guess they kind of did, right? They tip over too easy. Four is stability. Four has traction. Four will get you to move forward. So when you think of these verses, I want you to think about these four areas or these four tires. Now, you know if you have driven a car and had a flat tire, what happens? Right? You'll go into the ditch. Or if you have a, a tire that is underinflated or a tire that's overinflated and you are fighting the whole time. So having each tire um, in good condition and ready for the road helps you to go farther and go forward. Same is true in our life. If we are missing one of these four areas, we are going to have to be fighting the whole time or we're going to end up in the ditch. So we 
have to think about when you evaluate and diagnose your own life and if you are wondering why you're not moving forward or why it's so hard or why things are shaking as you drive down the road, check your tires. (laughs) Check these areas. So the first area, and I do have tires here to help us as an illustration, that Jesus drew in wisdom. This is the mental tire. Not that this tire is mental, okay? This is our intellect. This is not just our knowledge, but this is also our understanding of what to do with knowledge. This is an area that you must focus on. Focus on growing in wisdom. Scripturally, wisdom is the capacity to understand and function. So how do we help ourselves and how do we help our children to grow in wisdom? How do we focus in on this wheel? Well, we show them what to do, and more importantly, we tell them why we do it. Now, unless your kids wear Velcro or slip-on shoes, you probably taught them to tie their shoes. And so you told them this is how we tie it, and hopefully went through and showed them and showed them and showed them. But it's not just showing them how, it's instructing them why. My children's names are Anna, it's our oldest, but another daughter named Deborah. And so when we were teaching them, we'd say, Anna, this is how we tie your shoe, right down here. You know why we want our shoes tied? Because if they're not tied, and you start running, and if you're on concrete or pavement or something hard, you may accidentally step on this, and it will stop your other leg from moving, and you can trip and then really hurt yourself. That's why we want our shoes tied, Anna. So Anna not only knew how to do it, but why Same is true as they grow older. We have a responsibility as parents and grandparents to help. Another example would be money management. Thank you very much. It's more than just giving them allowance for good behavior. It goes beyond that and saying, now here is this quarter, if you're cheap, (laughs) $5, $10, whatever it is. You earned this. And then instructing them as to what to do with it and why we give money to God and why we put some away to save and why we balance our checkbook. Wisdom for life is important. I've talked to many school teachers, and by the way, you need to pray for school teachers. Being a teacher is a sacrifice, and the teachers may know. You think you have it hard with your two children? Try 32 children. For six or seven or eight hours without air conditioning. I've talked to, just this last week, a kindergarten teacher among us. And the things that she sees and has to deal with, with kindergarten. Running around the classroom. Um, using vulgarity. 
towards the teacher and towards the principal. Kindergarten. Now, I don't know that student's home life, but I imagine it's different. This is often why parents are excited when school starts because now they don't have to deal with them anymore. That's a problem. So we not only need to pray for our teachers among us, we're going to go back a step farther. We need to pray for the parents. And it is difficult to raise children, and we can say amen to that. It's a heavy responsibility, but it also is a great joy. Come on. We need to pray for our parents. Parenting is difficult. And we can point them towards these verses and say, focus in on these areas. Understand this time is growth, so it requires grace. It requires patience. Understand that you need to Focus in on helping your children or your grandchildren grow in wisdom. Create in your child a hunger to learn and a process for learning. Invest in education over entertainment. Amen. We played a lot of educational board games when we were young, the kids were young, and the kids didn't know they were learning. We did that, a lot of it. We didn't give them allowance for doing chores around the house. You know why? Because we expected them to do chores. You, you did chores around the house because you were a part of the family. You were not rewarded for the minimal requirement. We expected it. We did reward them for things that would help them, some external motivation so that they would become internally motiv- motivated. We gave them money for reading books. And as they read books, they learned. And as they learned, they applied. And as they applied, they liked it, so they read more books. If you're a parent, I would encourage you to reward behavior that you want repeated. We intentionally watch good movies. Sometimes I am aghast at some of the things that parents in our day allow their children to watch at young age. Not okay. We intentionally watch movies and then we talk about them. What did you see? What did you like about their interaction with each other? What values of, say, courage or kindness or goodness that you saw. Our girls became accustomed and then addicted in a good sense, to good things. It grew their minds, and now we still listen to books together and talk about them, even to this day. Expand their minds and their horizons Have them talk to people, shadow them, take them to see things in this world, stateside, internationally be intentional. As we heard, get wisdom. (laughs) Why? Because it will reward you. It will honor you. It will bestow on you a beautiful crown. So Jesus himself, the author of life, grew, it's hard to think, in 
wisdom. This is an area, even in your life, that you need to look at. (laughs) If the wheel of your life is shaking, it might be that you have a deficiency in wisdom. Check the tires and see what's going on. Focus on developing wisdom in your life, in your grandchildren's life, in the life of your children. First wheel. Second, Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature. Stature is the physical wheel. Well, your cameras can catch these. The physical wheel, which tells us that our bodies are important. And we can say amen. Not only do you teach your children about how their body works, but you teach them how to take care of it. And you can say, oh, amen, right? How well do you think you're going to do in school, whoa, if you only sleep about six hours a night as a 10-year-old? It grieves me as a parent and as a pastor when I go shopping sometimes late at night, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. And here's mom with her two school-age children. Now, I don't know the story. I'm not trying to be judgmental. But I think about those kids, and they're dragging. And this is on a Tuesday night when they have school. How can we expect children, or even teenagers, or even those in their 20s who think that you're invincible, to function? If you're not sleeping, teach them how important it is to sleep. Teach them how important it is to eat things more than Hershey bars. I remember when, in my imagination as a nine-year-old, my life would be fulfilled if I had my bedroom Full of Hershey bars. How life would be so simple. Can you imagine if that's what you ate all the time? So we teach them to maintain their body, right? Jesus learned to maintain his body on what, how to sleep, how it works, what to eat. Eat, how important it is to get some exercise and have medical care. One of the best things we did for our children when they were young was keeping a consistent schedule. Amen, hallelujah. We went to bed every night, 8 o'clock. And right before we went to bed, we sang. And right before, right after we sang, we prayed every single night. When we still get together, our kids are 23 and 24, <laughs> before we go to bed, we don't sing anymore, even though I have plenty of silly songs. We do pray. Just help them to grow in stature. And sometimes our kids have problems because it's simple. They're just not sleeping enough. Or they have some type of imbalance going on. Or the food they eat is not really helpful. Help them. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. For physical training is of some value, and there is value. And this bridges the next point. A godliness is value for all things. Holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. So Jesus... Grew, time of growing, and wisdom, first tire. Stature, that's the physical tire. Thirdly, in favor. It's something that I pray for our kids, and something that I pray for our kids here, that they would have favor. You have not been praying that for your children or your grandchildren. I encourage you to pray that 
that they would grow in favor. When people think about your children, when they look at their resume, they will have favor. In what two directions? First direction is spiritual. The first one. Jesus grew in favor with God. This is a spiritual Have any of you heard of the five love languages? Anyone heard of those? It's a great book. I encourage you guys to look at it. Understand how you give and receive love. Okay, you can go online. You can look at it. It's really good. I went through that, and I go through that a lot with uh, premarital um, counseling with couples getting married. And even afterwards, it's one of the go-to places, easy to look at. It made me wonder... <laughs> I wonder what God's love language is. You know what? God's love language is not listed in the five love languages. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 14, 15. God's love language is obedience. Obedience. So which means that you see this in the life of Jesus. He was always obedient to his father. And obedient children get saved. 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 Not just obedience to their parents or their teachers. And you want to teach your children to be obedient, not because of the rule of law, but because of the love of God. Why? Jesus grew in favor with God, pleasing his Father, getting to know God. This is done, as you know, by reading his letters, his words, talking and listening in prayer, participating in what God is doing. We were a family in ministry. In ministry. We taught our kids how important it is to serve because it puts the word of God into action. Bring your kids or your grandkids to hear the word of God, but more importantly, to live the word of God. Growing and favor with God. It's important to grow spiritually. Mentally is important, wisdom growing. Physically is important. If that wheel is doing good, go forward. Growing in favor with God is important and e eternally important. And lastly is this. Grow in favor with man, men or mankind. It's the social wheel. You and I, as parents or grandparents, need to help our children be social. By the way, uh, for the most part, we homeschooled our kids. One of the questions back in the day, when homeschooling wasn't cool, right? Now, it's actually pretty dang cool. There is about 400 people in this building on Tuesday. Did you know this? We host a homeschool group. It's one of the ministries that you participate in, and you don't even know it. And supplying, supplying uh, providing for this place, you're providing for that place, what they're doing as well. But the, one, of the, uh, <laughs> one of the criticisms we'd always get in telling people you were a homeschooler, number one, they thought you were, like, weird, Right? And they're like, do you make your own clothes? 
Do you drive a buggy? <laughs> yeah, we do. We don't. <laughs> we chose to homeschool not to primarily protect our kids, but to prepare our kids. And we'll talk about that in just a second in conclusion. Social reality. How do we interact with people? The power of looking someone in the eye. Verbalizing love. Connecting and how to make friends. How to show and to receive love. It's often verbal and nonverbal communication. It's taught them important to be on time because you love people and to keep their word. We told them that we treat people well. Why? Because they're created in the image of God. Every person has value regardless if they have the cool clothes or they wear the same thing most every day. Regardless if they come to school in a Mercedes or they come to school in a very junky Bronco in 1989 that was busted. Why do we treat them well? Because they're valuable. Why are they valuable? Because they're created by God. We obey the rules because of love. We honor people because of love. <laughs> That's why. Focus on growing in favor with people. A friend loves at all times. A brother is born for adversity. And if I want to say if there's <laughs> one plague, and there's many plagues that uh, affect us in our society, it's the plague of loneliness. People are lonely. We've seen that in greater degrees in our season of isolation. Be a friendly, but be a friend. So I'm going to conclude. And if you think about this car, and you think about these tires, there's two philosophies of parenting. One is to make sure that every road is clear of obstacles and potholes. Every place they go is safe and sanctified and sterilized. That's one way to do it in some Parents do that, trying to make everything perfect for their kids. Guess what, parents? You cannot do that. I'm going to say it's foolish to try to do that. The better philosophy is to prepare your kids to handle any and every terrain. Prepare the vehicle, not the road. Prepare them mentally and physically and spiritually and emotionally, so that as they turn the next turn, and as they are no longer in your sight, they will continue to move forward. It's simple. This is not a difficult message. Hopefully it's memorable as you think about your own life. Even if you are, Mike Tartaglia always gave me this joke, even if you are retired, you're not retired, you're retreaded. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. It's my only good joke, and it didn't come from me. You don't retire, you get retreaded. Keep moving forward. And there's so many in this room who are in their 70s and in their 80s and in their 90s. They may feel like they're a little bald, right? 
time to cut another groove and keep moving. And so many of you are keeping to move forward. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're showing us the way, and you're continuing to move where others have gone into one ditch or another. You kept moving. Thank you. Show us the way. Show those the way. Help them in these four areas. Please be involved in your kids, your grandkids, in our society. We need your help. But keep moving. Pay attention to what's taking place. Jesus went the distance with his life. Help us to grow like Christ and to move in his direction. So we are going to transition into communion. And Jim Black, part of our shepherding team, is going to lead us. After communion, we will have a song, a time of prayer. And by the way, if you have a specific thing you would like to be prayed about, there's always couples down here. I have failed to mention this, and I will remember to do this. Right down here, that are here to pray for you. We want to make sure, and they'll stay there as long as there are people that want prayer. See them. Thank you, Usher, for giving us these communion elements. And Jim, why don't you come on up? So I want you to think about these things when... You think about your life and help those around us and focus in on Christ and his goodness to us. Thank you, Jim, for leading us. Perhaps you have read 